Welcome back to the lab, guys. Today, I'm going to be doing Introduction to FreeNAS Part 2. So stick around. <music> storage appliances. What is a storage appliance? So FreeNAS is a storage appliance. A storage appliance is a NAS or kind of an IP SAN. Basically, it is a place that you can put storage or that I should say sharing storage out on your network. So what we do with FreeNAS, as I was explaining in my last video, we go ahead and we put a bunch of drives and let it have access to all these physical drives so it can get all that information and allow us to create arrays. And then we can go ahead and take those arrays and share them out over the network. Now, there's multiple ways to share them out over the network. You know, you can do SMB, just as I was talking about over here. All these different sharing protocols are available right here. So we've got all these different sharing protocols to be done, and one of the main ones is iSCSI. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, well, what's iSCSI? And I, I actually have a video, I'll try to link it up here, of what iSCSI is, guys, and go ahead and kind of watch that if you don't know what iSCSI is. But the reason we want to use iSCSI is because it does block level. See how it says right here, block? It does block level transfer to the host. So that means that whenever a host is wanting to read data, it's actually not reading at the file level. It's actually reading at the block level off of the drive, which is really great and fantastic for performance. Now, doing this, though, since everything's over the network, that means we could kind of have, you know, bottlenecks and things like that if you're using switches, say, especially if you're using dumb switches. And by dumb switches, I mean one that don't have a manageable interface. There's no way for you to log into it, change anything, change any ports, do nothing with it. It's just there. So dumb switches, you can use them. I'm not saying you can't. All right. Uh, the, what I'm going to say right now, let me preface everything. You can use dumb switches. You can use anything you basically want to get this tested, but I would not use it if it's in a production environment. As I said in my last video, you don't want the wife being pissed at you or your girlfriend or you know your significant other because you went and decided, hey, I'm going to build this really awesome rig, put all this cool stuff into it, and then you didn't listen to everything or you didn't do enough research and you lose all this valuable data and then now you're going to be spending time and spending resources trying to get back things that you need because it's what keeps your life going. So don't do that. Make sure you got everything figured out. Make sure you're following, you're looking at things, and you're, you know, you're making sure that your network's ready that your free NAS is ready. Make sure you're listening to these videos. I can't stress enough that the network's a big deal, guys. So let me go ahead and bring up managed switches now. Now, this becomes a big, like more pronounced kind of performance uh, hit. If you're doing VLANs and, you know, spanning tree, jumbo frames, layer three routing, all of that, it's really nice to have a managed switch because then you can go ahead and you can set up different VLANs. You can go ahead and set up spanning tree. You can change jumbo frames, which if you watch my iSCSI video is a big deal because it allows you to change the packet size and how big it is and allows it to kind of send a little bit more data and be a little bit cleaner when it does send that data. Now... There's kind of like some different things, you know, you guys can look at with switches. And I know one of the big things a lot of people are getting into is, oh, 10 gig, 10 gig. Now, cool. If you got the money and you want to do it, do it. Spend it. Go ahead. Do 10 gig. Um, that, that's awesome. It just, not a lot of people have the money for 10 gig. So one of the things I would recommend is definitely looking at getting like a quad NIC and setting it up so that way you can go ahead and actually, you know, take four one gig NICs and set them up so that way they're you know set up as four individual targets so you can do some load balancing so that way you actually will have about four gigs of speed for all of your hosts for shared storage and that just allows to make sure that you're not bottlenecking over a single one gig NIC which that that wouldn't be fun and to give you guys an idea I mean most raid volumes and most things like that don't have an issue you know saturating a one gig NIC they really don't and if you go with SSD cache and things like that, it won't be an issue at all. And if you know, you're somebody like me where I've got anywhere from 100 to 150 machines running in my stack at any time, you're, you're going to want the bandwidth, especially if you've got like a VDI environment, you've got cloning going on, you've got a lot of different things. Like it could be kind of stressful. So you're definitely going to want to want that bandwidth and want to manage switch. Now, I'm not saying that that's what you absolutely need. As I said before in the beginning, you can use a dumb switch. You want to get everything set up before. You can use a RAID controller. Do what you want. If you want to just get your feet wet, just please, like I've said before, don't put any critical data on this. Now, another thing, a common misconception people may not know is fiber channel. All right. Fiber channel does work on free Nash. You can set up fiber channel. There's ways to do it. Um, I wouldn't recommend it to me. If you're going to go fiber channel, you're probably better off spending the money on 10 gig. It's cheaper. It's easier, um, much more manageable. Now fiber, don't get me wrong. It's great. It's really fast. It does fantastic. Um, but it's just, to me, it's as a home lab, it's not worth the cost compared to 10 gig. I'd rather do 10 gig because then with 10 gig, I could also, depending on if I get a nice managed switch, I may be able to do 10 gig LAN and ice because they're on the same switch, you know, set it all nice up, you know, see what happens. And you can't really do that with fiber. I mean, you can, it's just, it's a pain. 
So that kind of sums up the network guys and everything you need to know about the networks and some different things with, you know, FreeNAS with how it handles its different, you know, sending device, uh, sending data and things like that. The other thing that reasons the network's important guys, sorry, and I didn't even cover this is the web GUI. All right, the web GUI is access over the network. Everything in FreeNAS, if you notice right here on my left screen, I mean, I, I hit IP address. Everything on FreeNAS is done through a web GUI. So one of the first things you're going to want to do whenever you get your FreeNAS system booted up is go over, look at the screen, and see what IP address I got, or do an IP scan to try to find it, because that's your way of getting in. And when you get here, it's going to ask you to log in. And once you log in, then you'll get this interface. Well, I'm actually on an older version here. I plan on updating once I get some new controllers in here in the next two weeks. So I can expand everything and I'll get everything updated. But the web GUI also is needed. So normally, like on my free NAS system, I have two one gig NICs that are set up. So that way, that's my web GUI. My web GUI can go over either one, load balance. And then I have four one gig NICs right now for all of my iSCSI traffic doesn't do too bad does pretty good I don't have major really major any issues I, I'm noticing that I need SSD cache but that's for a whole nother video and in another time so I am working on that though <laughs> but that's just what I want to tell you guys going on you know about networks and different things like that now the next thing I want to get on to is boot devices all right now you could boot from you know mechanical drives SSDs and things like that and I, I've had a lot of people ask can you boot from a USB yes you can just you need like a 16 gig minimum USB and I'd really recommend a 32. So like my free NAS system, I actually have a 32 gig USB 2.0 drive. Works perfectly fine. Popped it in, installed it. I've not had any issues. This guy right here runs on a 32 gig USB. Works great. Works fine. You can also go ahead and I have some people that pop in, you know, SSDs and RAID 1 them or they'll put them, you know, to mechanical drives and just RAID 1 them so that way they don't, you know, lose their configuration, which is fine too. You can do that also. Because it really sucked for the USB to die, which could happen to me, and I lose everything. So that's something to think about. How are you going to back up your free NAS configuration? All right. So now that we've kind of got the boot devices figured out, different ways, and you know the size that you're going to need to be able to boot your device, I want to go over to one of the more complex things of free NAS, and that's the ZFS pool configuration. All right. ZFS storage pools are comprised of like VDEVs, which VDEVs are a conglomerate, of, you know, of drives so you can take anywhere from like two to like 12 drives i wouldn't recommend anything bigger than 12 in a vdev and you could take those drives and put them in different raid sets now it's really cool zfs has a few different raid sets that you know, once i explain them you'll you'll kind of understand what it is so there's what they call mirrored which is exactly what you're thinking it's mirrored it's raid one they're going to go ahead and copy each other so you can have two drives raid one mirror that's what free nas has is mirrors you then have raid z which is just raid z it's RAID 5, and, you know, if you were to get technical and go into hardware terms, RAID Z is RAID 5, all right? Then you have RAID Z 2, which is basically similar to RAID 6, and then you have RAID Z 3. Now, there's really no analog for RAID Z 3, but to give you an idea, it's just triple parity. So it just means that it's striping across. You, you can have three points of failure instead of two. So in RAID 5, you have one point of failure. In RAID 6, you've got two points of failure. In RAID z3 you've got three points of failure which is nice so that way you know if you're running multiple v devs which is my plan here i'm going to be running um four sorry four uh 10 drive yeah 10 drive v devs and my plan is to put those all together into uh raid z3s and then i'm going to put some uh raid cache you know or sorry read and write cache uh, in front of that so zfs pool configuration all right I try to keep it you know if it's mirrored you need two drives at minimum raid z RAID Z, you're going to need three minimum. RAID Z2, you're going to need four. All right. RAID Z3, you're going to need five. So again, I give you an idea, but don't go above 10 to 12 drives in a single VDEV. I've had a lot of people tell me there's issues. Now, I currently have, let me go over here, but this is an older version of FreeNAS. I currently actually have, uh, I believe, 20 drives in a single environment, and I've not had any issues. But moving forward, I am going to go ahead and break them up into three or four different VDEVs, so that way I can kind of manage things, and hopefully I'll, I'll be following the rules, and hopefully, you know, I won't lose any data. I'm, I'm a big uh, person. I kind of like to follow what people are saying, especially the devs, if they're saying, hey, I, I wouldn't go over this. It's not been really tried or true yet. It's not been tested. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of follow their their lead and kind of do what they think is best and uh, see what happens. Now, this is over here. This is before I've done a lot of research. This is me kind of just messing around, figuring things out, and then as I got FreeNAS set up and got more into it, I realized how much I like it, and now here we are. <laughs> All right, 
So continuing, let me go ahead and take a drink of coffee real quick. Continuing, guys, I'm going to go on to the read and write caches, all right? Now, the next thing is I'm going to go on to write. Let's do write caches first, which is called a ZIL device, all right? A ZIL device stands for ZFS Intent Log, which means basically what is being intended to be written to the ZFS volume or VDEV, I should say. So as we were talking about earlier, you know, you have a RAID Z2 VDEV, all right? The ZIL could be a piece of SSD, sorry, an SSD drive that's in front. And what it'll do is instead of you writing directly to that VDEV, it'll go ahead and free now. So take in all that information that's being written, throw it onto the ZIL device. And when the ZIL and the processors have the time, it'll transfer it from the ZIL device over to the ZFS VDEV. And that allows you to kind of have those quick transfers and quick fire offs. That way, if you're trying to get things over there, you're not having to worry about it kind of building up and kind of shutting down. Because if not, it's going to be trying to do everything through RAM, which RAM is a great cache. Just remember, as I said in my last video, FreeNAS loves its RAM. And, you know, there are some RAM requirements for it. So keep that in mind. All right. Now, one of the things is, is with Zill, a lot of people are like, OK, well, what happens if my Zill device dies? Is there anything? Is this, you know, are there issues? No. That's, that's all right. If your Zill device dies, there'll be kind of a little bit of a hiccup, but nothing major. Everything will just kind of switch back over to RAM, and you'll be notified if you have your uh, notifications set up properly. Hey, your Zill device died. You need to replace it, and you just pop it back in and add it back into the pool, and boom, there you go. That's how a Zill device works. It's pretty easy. They're really nice. Just, you know, one of the things that, and I don't know, this is back in the day, but the Zill devices, when they first introduced, you had to make sure that they stayed powered on because if you lost power, it would cause a lot of issues. That's since been fixed, thank God. The devs have been amazing with FreeNAS and how much they've done and what they've worked. So it's fantastic. So I'd really recommend, and I mean, FreeNAS, if you actually go look online and you actually look up Zill devices, FreeNAS makes sure that a Zill device is almost sent with every single one of their, their storage devices when they send it to an enterprise, just because it really helps with needing to write things and to kind of keep things going and moving. Now the next one is read cache. All right. Now reading, there's a read cache called your arc. All right. And then you have your layer two arc. So your arc is normally stored on your RAM and that's basically your access tables. That's what's being controlled and what's being read. And what happens is, is the things that are being read more and the things that are being accessed more FreeNAS is going to go ahead and try to store that now in, in the arc. Now, what happens is a lot of times is if you go over here and let me see if I can kind of see where mine's at today. If we go to ZFS, if you come here and you see, look, I've got an arc of 86% right now going down to 62. One of the things, and this is why I want to add in layer two arc is they say once you, if you're not hitting 90% average on your arc, then it's best to add in layer two arc. As you notice, I have none. Layer two arc is SSDs. So what will happen is, is we can go ahead and stick another SSD. So you have one as your ZIL. You can go ahead and throw another SSD in front as your Layer 2 ARC device, which then goes ahead and allows you to actually have a read cache. So that way, whenever you're needing to access things and read things, things that are being read more or accessed more often actually get pulled to the Layer ARC 2 device. And so that way, instead of being stored in RAM, it allows your RAM to do other things, such as reading, writing, moving data, and actually making it more accessible and allows it giant performance increase actually if, it, if it's done correctly now one of the things is with layer 2 arc and you know there's a lot of debate on this and i've i've heard some things i try to and this is what i'm going to try to do they say one gig of ram for every 10 gigs of ssd space for l2 arc devices so just keep that in mind guys like i said in the first video remember what i said about all the ram if you don't go back and watch it kind of think about it just remember that you're going to need a lot of RAM for FreeNAS to make it really run optimal. Now, I'm not saying that you can run it with Memonal. You can. You totally can. You can run everything in Memonal. It just may not run the best, and you may have some device, you know, some issues. So that kind of wraps up my part two, guys. That's all I really wanted to talk about today. I kind of wanted to go over and just kind of bring closure and kind of wrap up everything for FreeNAS. Hopefully, this kind of, you know, answered some questions for you guys and kind of help you guys figure some things out. If you guys got any more questions, feel free to drop a comment down below. But as always, I'll see you guys in the lab.